let's start by looking at a landscape of AI. This, this is a uh, diagram I came up with for when I give talks about learning AI and specifically draw a distinction between what I call research AI and applied AI. And applied AI is things like machine learning, data science and statistics, and certain aspects of deep learning. Now, this doesn't mean there isn't also research going on in pretty much all of those topics, but rather that there are practical applied tools that were sometimes called citizen data scientists, for example, can make use of without necessarily getting into the deep theory behind those techniques. Now, when we talk about AI, normally or colloquially, what we're actually tending to talk about are these sets of techniques, which are most right side. So you have uh, deep learning, so neural networks and so forth, uh, which, which tend to be broken down further into supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning, uh, machine learning more broadly. So uh, again, coming up with analysis and results from uh, with a large amount of data, typically, uh, and then data science more broadly that a lot of the time involves things like cleaning up dirty data. Uh, there's certainly a statistical element in there uh, and so forth. A large variety of techniques to, in general, use a lot of data in order to get actionable insights out of it. And this has obviously been a very fruitful area of artificial intelligence over the last 10 years. Another way to look at that section of the AI landscape is with, through this lens that's provided by uh, Stuart Russell and Peter Norbig. Russell's at uh, UCAL Berkeley, Norbig's at Google, and they've written one of the more commonly used textbooks in the artificial intelligence field. And they break down the landscape into four boxes. So up in the upper left, you have thinking humanly, and we'll be spending a fair bit of time in this presentation on this around uh, cognitive modeling, neurophysiology, and so forth. Uh, thinking rationally on the upper right, this is the law logicist uh, tradition, and this is actually where a lot of AI systems, like expert rule systems that were very popular for a time, uh, really kind of come from this idea that you have a set of rule trees and that you can, um, and, and that you can basically come up with answers through logic. And then the lower left-hand corner, you have acting humanly, and this is where things like the Turing test sort of live, this idea that uh, if you're doing the same thing as a human and you can't tell the difference between the computer program and a human being, maybe it doesn't really matter that much what how that is actually happening mechanically as long as you are acting as if you are intelligent. Um, and then finally, this sort of acting rationally, and this is where Russell and Norbig kind of come down to uh, in their textbook in terms of how they teach AI, this idea of having rational agents that are aiming to achieve the best or the best expected outcome. And they picture this learning agent, this rational learning agent like this. You have an environment the agent in some way gets the information from the environment through sensors. There's a performance standard, there are feedback loops, and then action goes out to the environment in some way. And this, this might just be a result, an answer, or it may, uh, in the case of robotics, for example, may actually uh, move a physical part or manipulate the physical uh, physical world environment in some manner. But again, it's a, it's a um, it's basically coming up with the best result that it can. It's being a rational actor. Now we see some echoes of this in other types of uh, fields that have been studied over time. Uh, for a long time, uh, this 
the field of psychology was dominated by something called behaviorism or behavioral psychology, which was trying to answer the question of how do humans and animals think and act. And one of the large figures of um, behavioral psychology uh, was a Harvard uh, professor by the name of B.F. Skinner, who you see in the left here. And he came up with this idea of a Skinner box. And basically this box with, say, a rat inside it. And through, uh, and through either a combination of rewards and punishments, you could you could condition, operant condition, uh, a rat, for example, to press a certain button or to otherwise uh, behave in a particular way by conditioning the rat. Now, the idea here was that they reject, the behaviorists rejected the theory uh, the involving mental processes because they basically didn't think that would provide reliable evidence. So it was really just the inputs and the outputs that mattered and not really kind of how you got from the input to the output uh, so long as you did. Now, how did this work out? Well, if when something like the this, uh, the rat pressing for food, um, simple behaviors, uh, Behavioral psychology did a pretty good job of understanding uh, how, well, not how, but predicting what decisions or what actions would be taken, but it didn't work as well in more complex uh, reasoning, human, human level reasoning, even higher, more complex animal related reasoning and behaviors very well. So, there, so it worked, but there seemed to be a real limit to uh, what it could do. Now, as we come back to this sort of whole machine learning, deep learning kind of area. It's obviously done some pretty amazing things in the last you know, 10, 15 years or so. Um, you know, for just give a couple of examples, uh, again, certain image data sets, uh, machine learning can actually give better results than humans under some circumstances. Uh, in terms of game playing, and this predominantly reinforcement learning, uh, the game of Go was thought to be very difficult for computers and that we wouldn't have a computer Go champion like we had a computer chess champion uh, for many, many, many years and maybe not ever. Um, what in fact happened was uh, over a fairly short period of time, uh, a Go computer was developed. It did in fact beat the human Go champion. Uh, and the re reason is, if you don't know Go that well, is that uh, Go is sort of, if you would, sort of more of a grand strategy game in some ways than chess is. And that therefore it wasn't as easy to uh, kind of assign values and to understand who was ahead in a particular state of the game. Um, because, you know, doing that by hand was, was often done when programming some of the original chess champions. But by, pro, but by basically showing uh, the Go computer, a bunch of games and have it play those games out over and over again, uh, basically it could teach itself to do, um, to do very well and in fact become the world champion. Now, having said all that, there are some concerns that maybe we're reaching the limits of our current uh, approach to artificial intelligence in general. I mean, pretty much all these deep learning techniques are based on some work that was originally dated back to the 1980s. And what's happened though, is that with enormous computation power, with the ability to store vast amounts and move around vast amounts of, of data, as well as specialized processing like GPUs and Google's uh, TPUs, um, 
basically application specific uh, types of engines, uh, we've basically thrown an enormous amount of brute force at some of these artificial intelligence problems and have in some cases come out with very good answers. However, people have started to ask, you know, is this deep learning trick. Um, it, it's just, just a one, one trick pony. What happens if we perhaps come out to the limits of the that technique? And Russell and Norvig again uh, in their in their textbook, uh, here's a quote from it, and we can report steady progress all the way to the top of the tree. So this idea that just keeping throwing compute power and maybe doing some incremental advances in neural network techniques might not be enough to solve um, to solve more and more difficult problems. And you know, I think one example you might point to is autonomous driving, for example, uh, make really rapid progress in a relatively short period of time. And um, you know, a lot of people were saying in 2017 or so. Oh, yeah, they're you're going to have self-driving taxi services everywhere by the end of the next year. You know, look how far we've come in five years. I mean, it's ridiculous to think in another one or two that this won't be a solved problem. And uh, in fact, we're sort of in a trough of disillusionment right now with self-driving and some of the some of the critics of autonomous driving, or at least this autonomous driving is just around the corner uh, have turned out really to be the correct people. Now, um, so let's go back to AI. Let's pull out our machine learning and deep learning and most of our data science. So those statistics, for example, still certainly play into here. And what we have is we have some of the fields that have gone into and really inform AI over time uh, and other fields which are separate disciplines, but that very much intersect with AI in various ways. Um, and I'll talk about some of these in a little more detail. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the left-hand side here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on linguistics or natural language processing, although this is interesting because this is another one of those areas that um, there, it, it, there's been massive amounts of research, the whole field of study, linguistics over time. And for instance, some of the early voice recognition, speech recognition, systems really try to do so from more or less first principles in terms of you know how the humans understand speech and what's really happened with our voice assistants and everything is uh, everyone's kind of well not everyone but many people have just kind of punted on that question for now and say let's throw lots of data at the problem and the results are reasonably good for voice recognition, for natural language processing, NLP, much less so. It's uh, Alexa tends to understand your commands. And I almost shouldn't have said that because there's one in the next room and uh, she might wake up. But in any case, um, can sort of transcribe your, your speaking reasonably well, not as well as a human, but really is it, you really can't carry on a conversation. Uh, the next two, the neurophysiology, cognitive science, and human machine interactions, I'll talk a little more about. Data privacy, uh, this is things like differential privacy, multi-party computation. I have a whole other talk on this, uh, so I'm not going to go into that here. Uh, and then some of these other things I'll dig into a little bit more. Uh, so, you know, mathematics is obviously a big part of this because mathematics kind of formalized some of the rules of logic and what rationality is and what expected outcomes are and so forth. The, uh, the equation here is something called uh, Bay Bayes' uh, theorem, which uh, is essentially how to make 
decisions under conditions of uncertainty and update your predictions uh, based on new information. And this is going to be very important for some of our decisions, some of our um, cognitive science things that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, mathematics also kind of gets into questions uh, in uh, the church Turing thesis, for example, states that a Turing machine can compute any computable function. Um, how do we reason with uncertain information? So to, again, statistics plays into this, as does probability theory and so forth. Um, Economics is interesting because I think I mentioned earlier that some of these fields are sort of apart from AI, and although they overlap, they have different traditions, if you would, than AI does. So they have tended to be in separate academic departments and the like. Economics, and that's Adam Smith over in the left here, you know, ask questions like, how should we make decisions to maximize payouts? You know, what should we do when others may not go go along? And this gets into things like game theory. You know, what should I do um, based on what I think you will do? And what you're doing is based on what you think I'll do. And this is, again, a kind of a whole theory of study around um, when multiple actors are acting in ways that are affected by how other people, other actors are doing things. How should we do this when the payout is far in the future? So the idea of yeah, have to, that further decisions out or maybe discounted relative to nearby ones. Economics is also interesting because it's, it's evolved from this very rational actor um, type of approach, of, you know, where everybody acts on expected outcomes and everybody is sort of doing the optimum type of thing. Now, I think intuitively humans have known for a long time that, no, people don't always do things there in their best interest. Humans have biases uh, and so forth. Um, but there was never really a theory about this. And in fact, uh, mainstream economists were really rather resistant to this idea that uh, that these weren't just sort of unimportant outliers. You know, basic economics was rational. But then Richard Thaler, who I was lucky enough to uh, have a couple of classes with when I was at Cornell, um, he actually won the Nobel Prize a couple of years for a, a couple of years ago for a sort of subfield of economics that's called behavioral economics that really has a, a theory around utility functions where where people uh, do not necessarily act in a maximize expected value. Uh, rationalist economist sort of way. So again, so um, psychology has sort of made its way into the economics fields. In fact, the sort of behavioral, uh, different, different behaviorism than uh, Skinner, but this uh, behavioral psychology um, really kind of infused economics with this sort of new behavioral tradition. And finally, and I kind of wanted to spend more time in this in this talk, but really don't have the time, but I'd encourage you looking into this, is system engineering and human machine interaction. So one of the questions is, is how do we design in safety at the level of the complete system? And you know, this has been a particular drum of Nancy Levison and others at MIT, for example. Uh, in terms of designing safety systems that account for these broader systems, including the human in the loop, um, that's an autonomous, well, sort of autonomous car crash. Uh, uh, over in the left-hand side there. And when you read about these kind of things in um, newspapers and so forth, you'll often read, you know, oh, the human was at fault because the human didn't do this. And this is this is not specific to autonomous vehicles, of course. Uh, it's uh, specific. It applies to many, many types of uh, 
major failures and accidents. And uh, Levinson and others sort of have a number of te techniques, uh, STAMP, STPA, uh, which are really intended to draw a kind of a broader box around the system and include the human, perhaps including even the management, the culture of company and so forth, uh, as kind of a way to, that you really you can't just sort of blame, oh, it's the human messed up, it's their fault. You really need to look at safety more broadly. Part of this is out of how do we anticipate the emergent behaviors that are coming out of these complex artifacts controlled by software. So, um, you know, again, where, whereas with Mecha purely mechanical system, you can do this component by component failure analysis, but particularly in complex software systems that are instantiated on hardware, you can have these complex emergent behaviors that are difficult to predict on a component by component basis. And then finally, how do human and computer decisions interact in systems with embedded autonomy? Um, this is the, this is an, a, you know, a whole area of study, uh, for instance, uh, at the Human Autonomy Lab at Duke that Missy Cummings, who's actually a former, uh, one of the early uh, female Navy, US Navy fighter pilots heads. And they're looking at these things like handoff of control. You know, this idea that, you know, if you're driving along the highway 65 miles an hour um, and in an autonomous system and works fine 99% of the time, but, you know, if the system can't just sort of go, oops, I don't know what's going on. Human, you have one second to take control and alarms start going off and the like. And you know, basically that doesn't work. And if you pretend it's going to work, you're going to fail. But what I'm going to focus on the last part of this talk is this neurophysiology and cognitive science area. Because I think this is an area, this is probably one of the areas that we've been studying for a long time, haven't made an awful lot of progress in arguably, although we have made progress. Um, and in some ways, as with, as with uh, voice recognition, for example, we've sort of punted to lots of data and lots of computers um, because we've been having trouble understanding how humans actually work. And this is really the thinking humanly quadrant of uh, Russell and Norbert. How do humans themselves actually think? Now, cognitive science a as a field uh, dates back to 1956. And 1956 is an interesting year because in the in 1956, John McCarthy up at Dartmouth had a summer workshop that's usually dated to the birth of AI as a, as a field. Um, John McCarthy, who was at Dartmouth at the time, would shortly go to MIT and then later have a long career at Stanford. Uh, Marvin Minsky from MIT was there. Uh, again, one of the other giants of AI. Um, Claude Shannon of Bell Labs was there, um, who was very instrumental in a lot of development of information theory. Um, so that, that was one gathering in 1956. And maybe a couple months later, though, uh, there was an MIT, IEEE symposium at MIT that is usually uh, sort of where cognitive science could start. Um, the term wasn't actually coined until um, almost 20 years later, but, uh, but the ideas of cognitive science were, were certainly present. And there were three fairly important papers that were uh, present, you know, presented at this event. And you had a paper by Miller on memory, you had Chomsky giving a paper on formal grammars and you know, that's linguistics, natural language processing um, later. Uh, and then uh, Newell and Simon gave a paper in the logic theory machine. And this was basically something they had uh, a program that they had written, which uh, I believe was presented at the, at the earlier Dartmouth uh, Dartmouth event, and this was a paper in that, and that's often considered to be the first artificial intelligence program that tried to do logical reasoning. 
And cognitive science asks questions like trying to figure out what is the cognitive basis for things like learning concepts? How do how do how do children, how do adults learn? How do we decide that things are similar to each other, that maybe kind of fall in the same category? How do we figure out what, you know, whether A causes B or not? How do we form representations from our, our senses? So we get in this raw data from eyes and ears and touch and so forth. Uh, and how do we form actual perceptions uh, based on those? How do we learn word meanings? How does language work? Uh, how do we predict the future based on what we know today? And how do we develop uh, real world intuitions? Now, um, and I'm going to quote Josh Tenenbaum at MIT, cognitive scientist at MIT, fairly liberally throughout the rest of this presentation. And at the very end, uh, there, there's a pointer to a course he co-taught, an, an MIT open courseware that's worth checking out. Uh, and he sort of said, it describes as there being two notions of intelligence. And the first of these is classifying, recognizing, predicting, data. And what we have in the right here is map, uh, cholera map by John Snow um, that essentially does it. These were cholera cases in London and basically by the pattern, John Snow predicted uh, that it was a particular well that was the cause of this cholera outbreak rather than the popular theory at the time that there was this miasma in the air. You know, germ theory was just coming in around this time. And that's an example of how you can use patterns even if you don't really know the causation model and that that can be useful. And this is basically what neural networks do. And you know, as in John Snow's case, humans can do this as well. And, and obviously for certain things, this this uh, just pattern recognition uh, is something that works um, and it can be useful. Um, so another example that Tenenbaum gives is Kepler's laws, Kepler's laws, which sort of describe planets and so forth in the solar system um, is really a, a descriptive model uh, based on Tycho Brahe's data predominantly, but it doesn't explain why it's like that, which Newton's laws and then later uh, general, as later modified by general relativity does. And, you know, this is, again, essentially what neural networks do. And you've got an input layer, you've got various hidden layers that do things like edges, combination of edges, object models, and then you get an output. Now, there's still some debate that's been going on for a long time to what degree the human brain actually mimics the way a deep neural network does. Uh, and there's various evidence that, yes, that, you know, there, there's, we, we, there's, there's an area of the brain, perhaps, that is associated with face detection, and maybe we have edge, uh, you know, horizontal and vertical edge detectors of various cases in our, in our uh, brain. Um, but although there's still some controversy about that, there does, however, seem to be some specificity uh, for certain types of functions in the brain. So in the, the drawing in the lower left, uh, that's showing Broca's area, which is, uh, in the dominant in the dominant frontal lobe is where speech is, and Paul Broca announced that uh, uh, in France in 1861. So there's been this idea of some specificity of function often detected with, for example, uh, because of in, because of uh, traumatic injuries to the brain for quite a while. And in the black and white in the lower right, um, that's 1957 from Penfield. And that, that was kind of further trying to identify specific regions of the brain that seem to have certain functions. Uh, Nancy Kamlisher at MIT has been very active in research here uh, using MRI machines to try and um, try and map in 
uh, specific functional areas of the brain. And in fact, there do seem to be fairly specific areas of the brain that are fairly constant from person to person with these kind of uh, speech perception and language and um, motion and shapes and so forth. Um, interestingly, there's no, not really evidence in the prefrontal lobe, which is where our higher brain functions are for this level of specificity. Or if there is, it's maybe sufficiently abstract that it is difficult to detect any differences. Now, Timum goes on to say, though, that there's also this second notion of intelligence that is really around explaining or understanding or modeling the world that's complementary to pattern recognition, um, but is more powerful. And I think intuitively, we can think why that might be the case. If we can explain why A causes B, um, causation, that is a more powerful concept and say, well, A seems to be related to B, but it's not clear what the mechanism there is. And yeah, but it does look like there's this correlation statistically, but we don't know why. That's not as powerful. And this model or this explanation, you really want something that's kind of come compact. It doesn't vary a lot. Uh, it's actionable for uh, a lot of things, including by, by planning. We can create plans using that. Uh, and it's compositional, so we can kind of take it apart and extend it and combine it with other things. Um, and ultimately, the question that we are kind of trying to answer, what you know, for for just Tenenbaum, what the central question is, is how do we computers get, we humans, um, really, I'm a human, not a computer, uh, get so much from so little? You know, our minds build these rich models of the world and make strong generalizations from really very little input data. And that, it, and that data can be sparse, it can be noisy, it can be ambiguous, and it, it shouldn't be enough for us to come up with answers. Certainly computers can't do it. And you know, this is, there's a whole bunch of examples. And uh, again, look at link at the end of this uh, presentation if you all see some more. But you know, as humans, we can look at these pictures. So you know, look in the upper right, upper left there, for example, and th those bicyclists. And we can glance in that and give a reasonable count for how many people are probably in that picture. A computer would have a lot of trouble doing so. And the same is true of, in, in these kind of other other pictures, these would be very hard for computers to kind of particularly look at, you know, some of those people way in the background that we only see part of. Um, yeah, how many, there, as humans, we can kind of glance at that and we're not going to get it exactly right, but we're going to probably get in the ballpark. Um, this is another one that's interesting because humans are all, you know, one of the criticisms is, oh, people see patterns where they don't exist. Um, and that's certainly true. Um, it's often the case. However, if you have a causal model for, say, a cancer cluster or something like that, um, and that model is on the right, and, you know, basically the model is how likely is it that given this pattern that there is a causative reason behind the cluster. In other words, how likely is it to be that this isn't, in fact, just randomness? And it turns out that people are not bad about doing this. You know, we look in the upper left and we go, yeah, there's a couple dots. They're kind of close together, but there's only three dots. And um, um, yeah, may, maybe. And you're basically picking a number from zero to 10 over how likely it is. And, you know, you then go in the upper right and go, yeah, that's actually a pretty big cluster there. There's probably something going on. Um, and it actually turns out that you run this experiment and humans are coming pretty close to the model. Um, so we actually are not bad. And we're just glancing at this stuff and coming up with a number and we're actually doing pretty well. 
And there's lots of other examples of this, of uh, judging, kind of judging similarity and judging causative, uh, causative effects. And what, we're, the, the, what cognitive scientists, or at least some group of cognitive scientists are trying to do here is come up with uh, what Tannenbaum calls a common sense core. And this includes things like looking at how um, children learn, for example, and the, the idea of don't approach learning as this thing that machine learning and deep learning models does uh, of data analysis or, you know, trying to find pattern, but theory building, you know, a baby, a, a toddler, you will kind of stacks up blocks and sees it falling, you know, see they fall over and go, oh, Okay, that teaches me something about the world. Um, and this idea of human thought is structured around basic understanding of physical objects, intentional agents, and their interactions. So physics, like the blocks falling over, or some intuitive psychology. And some of the research is pointing to, we have some sort of modeling, it seems like we have some sort of modeling engine that's built on probabilistic programs, but just the probabilistic programs by themselves are probably not a complete explanation of this. Um, there are some critiques of cognitive science. I put critiques in quotation marks here because I, I think many of these are recognized as areas of for further study as opposed to something that cognitive science is just deliberately ignoring. But, you know, emotions don't really come in here. This is still um, within the thinking humanly box. It's still kind of a rationalist view to you know, how we do things. Um, very importantly, it, is, it disregards the role of physical environments in, in human thinking. And, you know, there's, there's definitely uh, a school of thought that a lot of human learning and development is very related to manipulating the physical world. Um, and similarly, it sort of disregards, uh, in general, the physical factor in human thought and action. There's also a social element um, that is certainly uh, addressed in many cases by, in psychology, but it's probably not a primary threat of social science today. And then finally, um, you know, we, we can't be, you know, we can't just be an organic version of a computer because, you know, computers fill rooms. Uh, we have this little tenth of a watt or whatever thing sitting on top of our head. So we can't be doing things like computers are doing. I mean, of course, we know we don't do some things very well, like multiplying large numbers or factoring primes that computers, in fact, have very good algorithms in order to do. So the brain must be different in some way. Oh, as I said, if you want to dive deeper, this is, I was going to put a bunch of links here, but actually if you found this interesting, I think it's just a really good place to start. And there's references to tons of research papers in the in uh, that course as well. So I think that's the place to go. And now we have time for some questions. So thank you all very much. So if anybody has any questions, have a few minutes. So Gordon, um, I have a question, a question myself. Um, you mentioned at one point, right, like the importance of engineering, like the systems engineering aspect of yeah. it, right? Um, how do you sort of see that, you know, with this whole shift of computation towards like the quote unquote edge, um, how do you see that sort of thing into it, right, in aspects of like privacy or machine learning being applied for um, engineering these systems? Do you see that like as a, as a possibility or is that some? Well, you know, I, th I think the main point, well, in the terms of privacy, as I say, I encourage you to get, look at another talk I gave here uh, yesterday. It's up on YouTube now. But yeah, the uh, I, I think the general, I think the general thing, and uh, yeah, I actually took a, 
a stamp workshop with Nancy Levison earlier this uh, summer, which was one of the things that got me interested. But I think with that and the human factors interaction work, I think to a point uh, Shrey just made in the chat is, is sort of a, um, you know, let's not focus too deeply into the it's not all about machine learning. It's not all about the deep learning of we really need to take this bigger picture uh, and look at things as complete systems. And I think, I think in general, and you know, this isn't even purely the software industry. It's, you know, uh, you know, one Nancy's examples is uh, going through the Bhopal um, uh, chemi uh, Dow chemical disaster a couple decades ago or whenever it was. Uh, and, you know, yes, the proximate cause was the was a human doing something, but there were all kinds of systematic factors going up the stack that really kind of led to this low level worker doing something wrong and I and you know I think we absolutely see this with autonomous vehicles for example so Missy Cummings at Duke has been like very critical of of like any of these autonomous vehicle systems that say you know human needs to take over you know right now and um so so I think it's really just taking a look at the bigger picture um and yeah, William's asking here, you know, what, what are we doing at Red Hat here? Um, you know, I, I, I think from, you know, I think the system engineering part is very relevant to Red Hat because we, you know, we have software that runs on complex systems. I think we need to think about those kind of issues. In terms of the cognitive science part probably not you know probably not so much unless uh we ended up having some sort of connection through red hat research where uh where with red hat research we are doing some work with uh, universities like bu and so forth around things like differential privacy and multi-party computation and so forth so there's various things in those areas that we're touching on uh, with uh basically with our university programs um, does anyone else have any other questions? Well, if you don't, thank you all very much for your time and uh, have a good DEF conf. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks for your time, Gordon. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, just as a reminder, um, I think we have lunch now. Uh, I say I think. I know we have lunch now, so we'll be reconvening at 1.40 p.m. EDT um, for our next talk, which will be Reinforcement Learning Based Dependency Re Resolution by Friedel and Pokorny. Uh, William, yeah, lunch is in your kitchen. I'm sure you have something del delicious prepared. So, thank you all, and see you after the break. <laughs>